It's time to take command with former NFL tight end Logan Paulson and former Commander's Beat reporter Craig Hoffman. What's up? What's happening? Welcome in to Take Command podcast. That is Logan Paulson. I am Craig Hoffman. And Logan, we are less than three weeks from the NFL draft. What's up? Holly, I mean, let's go. Gosh, it's so exciting, right? Like all this, all I would, I had a conversation with somebody last year and it was like, man, this is such a fun time of year. And they were like, no, it's not. And there was a coach. And I was like, why? It's like, it's so much work for seven players. You know, you have to evaluate 300 guys, not, not the coaches, but you know, they watch 15 guys, they read the reports, they go through all this stuff. And it's, you might not even draft a guy you've, you've researched and watched. So it, it is an interesting time. And I'm kind of like, I've watched more guys than I've ever watched this year, so it kind of feels a little bit overwhelming at times. We're like, what's my evaluation on him? What's my grade? So I'm really excited for the opportunity for this to be done and kind of get the resolution and see who they finally pick. So, Yeah, no doubt. Um, actually, That actually reminds me of something else I wanted to, to talk about uh, real quick uh, in a second in terms of the process. But uh, that does actually remind me on the broadcast side of a conversation I had, name drop incoming, in 3-2 with Mike Tirico uh, when I was in college. <laughs> uh, of course, the great Syracuse alum. I was in, in school at Syracuse at the time. And I remember talking to Mike about play-by-play. And he's like, I don't use 90% of my prep. And I was like, this is why I want to become a talk show host because that sounds terribly (laughs) inefficient and like a lot of work. Uh, And now, of course, I'm at a stage in my career where I'd actually love to dabble in a little play-by-play. So if anybody out there listening wants to hire me for a play-by-play job, uh, you know, in addition to what I'm doing now, I'm not looking to leave. Uh, Let me know. All right. Uh, But I actually, the the process thing I think is interesting. And I've kind of had this, uh, this epiphany over the last couple of days, Logan, which is... I thought that from January to when we started this to certainly by now uh, and definitely by uh, the time that they're on the clock at number two in a couple of weeks, I would come to a conclusion on who I thought they should pick, where I thought by the end of it, like there would be a clear answer to me that they should go in this direction at number two, that it would be Jaden Daniels or Drake May would, was certainly at the start of the process. Uh, it was one of those guys that they would they would separate themselves in some way. Um, all of a sudden now I, I'm sitting here a couple of or a week or two and a half weeks from the draft. And I'm like, I not that I don't care um, who they take, but I don't have a preference. And I think like in the last week, I've come to realize I'm not going to have one right. that I'm going to get to draft day and go. Any of the three works yeah. for me. I can justify any of the three. Any of the three makes sense. And I'm curious in your years of doing the scouting reports, and for those that have not heard Logan tell the stories before, um, Logan used to do scouting reports kind of for fun, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I don't, yeah, it was just for fun during your dur- during his playing days. So you've been doing this a while. Um, and then obviously on the media side, can you ever remember something quite like this where you just kind of get to the end and if you were on a team, you'd be like, guys, I really don't know here. Um, And it's not that you need more time. It's just there doesn't seem to be a lot of separation. Well, I think that I think that that is the crux of evaluation. Like I was talking to uh, one of my really good friends last night, and he's a great evaluator. And I really respect his opinion. And, you know, like I know, before we even talk, like which guys he's going to like and which guys he's not going to like, like, I I just, you know what I'm saying? Like, I know stylistically who he's going to prefer. And that doesn't mean that if you like the guy that he doesn't like, that you're wrong, right? It's just like, it's, he likes this type of person. I like this type of person. And that's part of the evaluation process. Is it just, it's incredibly subjective. And so, yeah, there's times where you're like, flip a coin. I don't really care because they're about the same. You know, it, it really depends on, you know, whether the coach can get them better. Like I was thinking I was doing something with a Marius Mims last night, you know, and like you're, I was watching some film going through his seven games and, you know, the film's excellent, but there's still a little bit of development there. And he's got to go to a situation where, you know, there's some stuff about him, kind of like his work ethic, his maturity, all this stuff starting to kind of come out through the process. And you're like, he's got to go to the right spot. You know, like he kind of reminds me a little bit of like Dewan Jones last year, like the talent's undeniable, but the situation, the landing spot's so important. So some teams, and I'm just speaking like, I don't know this for a fact, we'll probably have a Mary Smims off their board for those personality concerns. Not that he's a bad guy, but just like we just cannot tolerate someone who's not going to be a self starter. Other other organizations, like if you're Tennessee with Bill I was Callahan. About to say, yeah, with if Bill you're Callahan, Tennessee at seven, you just be like, this guy's so talented and we have Bill Callahan. 
Yeah, we have Bill Callahan, or if you're Philly, right? Like you've got these O line coaches, and this, and it's a culture in the O line room that yeah. I think can tolerate it, right? So, I, I, just him as an example, like I love Amarius Mims. I think he was like my fifth or sixth player recently, like in terms of offensive line rankings because of the talent. But again, like I don't have to build a team. I have to kind of, you know what I'm saying? So I think like for us, yeah. when it's like here are the quarterbacks, they're all laid out, and we don't really care. You better believe stylistically, some of these people are going to be like, absolutely not because of XYZ or absolutely yes because of XYZ. It just depends. And so I think if we had a team to build, we'd be much more opinionated on the direction we wanted to go. Like stylistically, like if we knew, like if, if we had talked to Cliff hypothetically and he said, this is what I want to be. This is what I want to do offensively. This is how I want to win. There's a guy in that three that fits that more acutely. Right. And I think it's. Right. And I think, I think we've done a pretty good job, I think, of kind of showing the gray area. Like, you know, I think on the last show, I was like, you know, Drake May's got the highest ceiling, but also probably the lowest floor. Someone interpreted that. And they reached out to me and said, like, why do you hate Jaden Daniels? I don't hate Jaden Daniels. I think he's a really good football player still. But I think there is a potential for Drake May to be a better football player. And I think you have to acknowledge that. But Jaden Daniels, I think, brings a lot as a runner. I think he processes well. I think he's got a live arm, like a like a quick release, an okay arm, but the playmaking is undeniable. And then J.J. McCarthy has his own thing. So I just think it's important to acknowledge that if we had a structure of a team to build, we would probably lean into certain traits a little bit more and be able to be a little bit more definitive. But ultimately, like that's why I prefer the tier system, right? Because like they are the same in my mind. It just depends on where they go in terms of what's going to dictate their success the most. Right. And and so that's the thing is, is, as you said, we don't get to shape the direction of an actual team, which I think is why I'm stuck. Like, I actually feel like the evaluation is complete and I can't make a decision in part because I'm glad we're talking this out because this just kind of clicked for me, too, is like we still don't know what Cliff wants to do right. or what what Dan wants to do offensively. Right. It, ultimately, it's his team. Um, he's hired Cliff for now. And if things go great, maybe Cliff's getting a head coaching job in a couple of years, whatever. As you've talked about, uh, Cliff's offense evolved a lot in Arizona and looked very Shanahan-esque uh, by the end. And like, if that's the case, then is there a, a, a desire to go uh, in the J.J. McCarthy direction, for instance, because a lot of people think he's the best fit in a West Coast system. If they want to be super vertical down the field, you'd think it'd be one of the one of the guys with the stronger arms like a Drake May, but actually Jaden uh, Daniels throws the best deep ball and has the best touch of the group so like there's it's so hard and convoluted because we don't actually know like are we trying to fit a square peg in a round hole or is the 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 peg uh, or is the the hole actually square too like we we yeah. actually don't know the way we're sitting here right now and then the other big part of it is the interviews and that's that's an area that we're going to dive in a little bit more today um, but it's a leadership thing and then it's also a processing thing uh, and we'll get to the processing part in a second but I, I think it's also hard because these guys, thankfully, um, I think all three of the guys that are in consideration at two, they all check out on the leadership stuff. Like yeah. Daniel's work ethic is legendary. JJ, obviously coming from that Michigan program, uh, it is a winner amongst winners. Um, and then you got Drake May, who's apparently very mature and he handles a lot of the line of scrimmage and like there's a lot of mental pluses to his game as well and thus some of the things that in other years might become separating factors it really is down to like the football stylistic choices as far as we're concerned because that is a big piece of data that we are missing no i i totally agree and i think um you know it's funny like when i talk to my buddies who are in the league they'll be i'll be like oh man i, I really like this guy they're like you shouldn't because of xyz and it's nothing to do with the film it's because the interview was bad or whatever so i think like people underrate because again like we, we're watching you know pixels on a screen and we're watching them complete the football and do the things and they all do that really well but I, I, it's so easy, and I've mentioned this a bunch of times. I'm just going to keep reiterating it because I think it's so. I think it's this important. If I don't really like you, I don't care how good you are. I'm not going to invest in you. Like I've been in places where you know they've drafted a tight end or they've drafted a receiver that has some ability, but you can tell the receiver coach was not a included in the decision or doesn't like what the guy brings. You know, like he just wasn't invested in the pick. And the guy doesn't develop. And that's a little bit on the player, but it's also on the coach. Like if I'm involved in you and I like you and I, I'm invested in you and I want you to get better, I'm going to push harder to make that happen. I'm going to stay like when I was talking to one of my tight end coach buddies at the comedy. He's like, oh, yeah, we had a first round pick and he was having a hard time picking it up. And I would stay with him for two hours every day after meetings had ended. So from 4 to 6.30, I would stay with him and we would review game plan. Not one day a week, every day. And I remember that player 
very vividly because he was a first round player and he was incredibly productive for the first two years while he was under this guy. That guy left, they brought a new guy in and his production really dipped, but that staff and he was invested in that player and they made it go. And I think like, that's what ultimately I think is happening right now is you got to find this person of these three guys or actually of the five guys, you know, like Penix, I'll put Nixon, uh, Penix in here also too, that you like the most, you think you can get better, and you think it's going to execute your offense at a high level. And that's not from the film necessarily. That's from me meeting you at the senior bowl, at the combine, on the 30 visit, at the pro day. Like that's when that stuff happens. That's me talking to your coaches. Like that's why this, pro- this, this period before the draft is so incredibly important. Um, let me ask you one other scouting thing, your take, your buddy's takes all the things, um, because I heard DJ talking about this with Mina Kimes the other day, Daniel Jeremiah, um, specifically about Penix. Um, and I've kind of been thinking about it ever since the Texas game for Penix is one of the great college football games that you will ever see a quarterback play. I mean, he was unbelievable and he showed everything, um, like all the stuff that you have questions about. If you want to see Michael Penix do it, you, you'd. You go watch the Texas game and you're like, oh, he moves in the pocket. He can take off and run a little bit. Uh, he layers throws. He's got the deep ball. He's got balls over the middle of the field. He's got balls to the outside. It's literally everything. It's an unbelievable football game. And if that's who he is, then you should take him. Forget forget it, too. Yeah. Like The Bears should take him at one right. um, if that's who he is. And DJ's thought, not, and, and he doesn't have him up at one. He's got him, I think, at five um, or maybe six behind Knicks, um, just kind of depending on the style of quarterback that you want. But his thing was, he's like, back when I was in the scouting world, our, our saying was, if you can do it once, then you can do it. Right. And it's just a matter of like, okay, how consistently can we get that out of the guy? But to say like, oh, Penix can't do this, can't do that. Well, he did against Texas, uh, yeah. move, moving in the pocket being one of the, the really, really big ones for him. How do you evaluate like the outliers of games for a guy like that? Because if you if you look at who he is game over game, he's probably QB five or six, depending on what your style is between he and, and Bo Nix. If you look at him as the potential he is based off of that game, then he's in the, this mix to to go second overall. Yeah, and I think that's that's a really interesting conversation because they do like if you're a good scout you watch a highlight reel and you watch a low light low light reel and I, I do that now you know I do that a lot with DBs just because it's easy like DBs they don't touch the football enough right so I got to figure out what they can do and how they move so I watch a highlight reel just to kind of see what they are and I think it's very helpful because you're like well this is the guy's ceiling as of right now and so when you watch that Texas game I think like you said like there's a lot of really good stuff there and I don't think we should diminish Penix's career because it was very good throughout out. you know I mean that's one game that was the that was a big stage for him but I mean he threw for over 4,000 yards like dude is a really good football player yeah. I think the thing about the Texas game is while you see kind of the best version of him just in this Michael Penix as an example right while you see the best version of him you also see the issues that I have with him right kind of this like it's not a super super smooth movement in the pocket like he's missing throws he probably should hit just because he's not good with his fundamentals and his feet like he hits a lot of throws and he does some dramatic stuff his arms live like that's also there but they're still underlying all the problems that you see with him so even at his best he's going to have some of these issues which are going to lead to um some inaccuracies right it's kind of some of the same things we got going on with drake may right it's like the technical foundation that you're throwing the football from and the technical foundation you're playing the position with are going to lead to some misses now can you get that cleaned up and i think people would look to that game and say yes because he played a pretty clean game that game and it was pretty on but i i just think that's the important thing is like yeah the ceiling's important but as and i think this is where you see coaches and scouts kind of get in get on different pages a little bit because it coaches like it's interesting like I was talking to one of my coaching friends a couple weeks ago and he was like this is my top five O-linemen and that it would shock you quite quite frankly if like for the it was people that like you're like what that guy's your number one guy and he's like the fifth or sixth guy on public boards and you're like wow okay but I get it because they believe that player is more likely to get there because of the interview process because of the tenacity because of the toughness and I think that's where you see coaches as they get into the process, which is, you know, last week, the week prior, maybe the week, maybe the last three weeks, they value different stuff than scouts. And so like, while the ceiling's really high, it's my job as a coach to be like, can I get this guy to do that all the time? And if I don't think so, I'm going to say that in the meeting and be like, no, I, I, while this is really good stuff, 
I don't think I don't, this is not our guy for us. And there's legendary stories of coaches going into the scouting rooms and ripping up names and throwing papers because they're like, we do not want this guy in the program. And I think it's, again, it's, it's just people are coming at it from different perspectives. Some people are saying, hey, this is the ceiling, which as a scout, you should do. But as a coach, it's my job to say, how realistic is it that we get there? And I think that's where you get this kind of difference in philosophy. And I think it's important to acknowledge that as well. Like Daniel Jeremiah is a scout. But as a coach, like not me personally, but as coaches that I've talked to, like what is the likelihood that Penix, who is a six-year player, changes and cleans up some of this technical stuff and can get it done. So that's where you get the discrepancy. And that's you, one's very optimistic. One's a little bit more realistic. And I think you get like, that's why the division at this time of year is so interesting. Yeah. And then you get the medical staff. That's like, Hey guys, he's 24 with bad knees. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's not. And so that's obviously the biggest thing uh, for him is like, by the time you get to your second contract, if you're almost 30 and have bad knees, like that is not, uh, not necessarily someone you want to spend a top 10 pick on, even if, if purely on the tape without a resume, uh, that he's, he's pushing that kind of, uh, that kind of film. Um, don't forget coming up later this week on take command, Mina Kimes is going to join us. I don't know if we've even announced that on the show yet. Have we even said that on this show? I don't think, I, I don't think we did. I think I said it on the radio show. <laughs> Surprise. Mina Kimes is going to join us on the next episode of Take Command. And then early next week, Dane Brugler from The Athletic. Dane's releasing The Beast, as it's called, their 400-page yeah. draft guide. Uh, so that is going to be out, uh, I believe, uh, Wednesday is when that launches. And Dane is going to spend some time with us uh, on the Monday show. Uh, we're actually going to publish that. We're Full transparency. We're recording it Friday morning, uh, and then we will be out first thing Monday morning. So excited for that. So make sure you are subscribed to Take Command so you do not miss an episode with Mina uh, coming up later this week. We're going to do a mock draft, and we're going to we're gonna do it in the style that she does on her show, the War Room Mock Draft, which means, Logan, I have a lot of prep to do. Uh, and, or actually, we might have a lot of prep yeah, to do. Well, I know, I'll I know help what, you out. I'll help you I know out what we're doing uh, in terms of the final product. I don't know exactly how we're doing it yet, but that's an off-air <laughs> conversation. Uh, but we're going to have two players, and Mina's going to have to pick between the two. Uh, so we will do that coming up later this week with Mina Kimes. Next, though, let's dive into one of the biggest questions we keep getting on these quarterbacks, which is what about the processing speed when it comes to and the processing ability of these players? How do you judge that on tape and who comes out ahead between J.J. McCarthy, Drake May and Jaden Daniels? That's next on Take Command. Continuing on take command. So Logan, ultimately, if I were to ask you what characteristics, what traits, what things do you want in a quarterback? Processing ability, the ability mm -hmm. to, to clearly see what you're supposed to do and then ultimately executing and doing that thing is going to be at the top, if not near the top of the list. We talk about this all the time, that it's a mental position as much as it is, uh, or even more so than a physical position. We talk about it during the year that you know your strong arm only helps you so much. You got to know where to go with the football and when. So when you watch the tape of J.J. McCarthy, Jaden Daniels, Drake May, how do you try to evaluate that part of their game, uh, you know, without necessarily knowing their offense, how they're coached, whatever? Like, what yeah. can you see that makes it clear on a big picture level? And then we can dive in to the three of them. Yeah, so I think the things I'm looking for, like, you know, obviously when you have the all 22, like when I'm watching the commanders, one of the things that makes it easier is you can kind of see the defensive structure and you kind of can approximate the concept because you can see every, what everyone's doing, right? So obviously we don't have that. We don't have that now because of how the college game is and how the, uh, they, they allocate the college film. But one of the things that I try to do now is I just try to look at this. I try to look at when they get to the top of their drop, are they in rhythm with the concept? So that's like a really easy one to do because you just watch them drop back. If they're patting the football, if they're kind of shuffling their feet, they're not seeing it. They're not digesting what the defense is presenting. So that's kind of a really good like you to, to use a saying you use all the time, like canary in the coal mine. If it's off, if it's off timing, they haven't seen it very well. They're not processing what the defense is doing really well. So I think that that's one element, right? And then it's like taking that element and then extrapolating off of it. It's like, well, if they are padding, what's going on here? Like, why are they doing that? Oh, they're in drop eight defensively because there's three defensive linemen and they're under under the pass concepts. Or this guy got gloved up in a man-to-man -man situation and there's nowhere to go with the football. Or it's like, this guy's just a baller and he understands like, 
this is closed off and my feet are decisive to number two and the ball comes out, right? So I really think like honestly decisive feet in the context that we're watching film is one of the best indicators of of kind of how you're seeing the field and the defense. And now as we talk about all three of these guys, we're going to be able to kind of give pluses and minuses where they need to be, but also some context on this is going to be super important. And I think that's it's so that that's like my number one thing that I look at, but then I have to understand like the context around what the offense is and what they're asking the guy to do. No doubt. So when I first watched Jaden Daniels, that was the thing that stuck out to me is I felt like he was on time in rhythm with a high, high level of consistency that the ball would just like, he'd hit the top of his drop. The ball would come out or he would step up in the pocket and the ball would come out. He'd get to number two. Um, or even he was decisive as a runner. Um, and I think the more people that we've talked to and the more that you watch, you realize like, okay, there are times where he's one and run, uh, where it's like, if, if it's not there, I'm just going to take off. And when you're as good of a runner as he is, Okay, if I'm his coach, especially at the college level, I'm fine with I'm I'm actually telling him that. Hey dude, if it's not there, don't don't mess around. If you got a lane, take off. Run. Because you're like you're not gonna throw the ball to someone who is a better person with the ball in their hands than you are. So just just go. <laughs> um and so I don't mean that as like a shot. I don't mean that as a negative, but that's that's I would guess in part how he was coached up, um, mm -hmm. is to not not mess around back there. And so Ultimately, I think his ability to play on rhythm really stood out to me. And it's why, you know, before we got our hands on the all 22 and whatever, there actually was a bit of separation for me. Like he was the guy. And I think, you know, the context we can add back in why it's evened out. But I think it's also important to say, uh, because apparently everyone on the internet thinks I hate Jaden Daniels. Like the other guys have come up to Jaden. It's not that Jaden has dropped or I dislike Jaden. If they take Jaden at number two, I will be thrilled. Like he's, yeah. I think, I think there's so much to like there. Tremendous leader, great playmaker, live quick arm again not the strongest in terms of velocity but knows how to use what he's got great deep ball like will make explosive plays love it but the ability to play on time and on rhythm showed to me something that that immediately stood out as a huge positive so when we talk about the processing speed i am guessing that that is that is in the pros column for Jaden daniels yeah, I mean, it was for me for a long time. And then I think, when was it, last weekend I went through and I watched all of his throws again. And I think the thing about Jaden that is it's not his fault, and I don't know exactly how to quantify this, is the offense and the passing concepts are, like, incredibly simplistic. It's like, here, run a hitch. Here, we got three by one away. We're going to work um, a comeback. And it's like there's not – and he's doing a good job of getting the ball out with timing and anticipation. But I heard, uh, I heard someone – I forget who I heard this say this, but – basically like because he's got such good receivers he can throw the ball with great anticipation understanding that they're going to win it was kind of like the same thing with Dak Prescott two years ago when he had you know Amari Cooper and CeeDee Lamb and all these guys that were just going to win and he and he could throw a comeback almost blind he'd be looking to the left shift his feet and throw the comeback and it was and he could throw it on time and on rhythm and he knew the guy was going to win there's a little bit of that to Jaden Daniels where it's like you're working outside the numbers and if we're working over the middle of the field this is not all the time, but it's like a crossing route late where everything's been cleared out. There's a guy wide open. You hit him in stride. So great job with the ball placement. Great job with the accuracy. Like there's sometimes where you're watching Drake May where he doesn't hit those throws because his fundamentals aren't right. So you got to give credit where credit's due. He's hitting the throws he's supposed to hit. But there's just a an ease to the offense from an intellectual standpoint that that is – that is very, very high. Like it's very easy for him. So like, that's where it's like the processing is really good. He's getting the ball out. The timing's excellent. He's hitting these, like there's a couple deep kind of digs he's hitting. Great. But there's so much space because of the guys he's thrown to, because of the route concepts, because of the protection, because of the trust he has in the receiver. So again, I, I don't really know how to quantify that. It's not a negative to him, but it definitely decreases the kind of, how impressive the processing was from his standpoint. Now there's games like the Texas A&M game where they're bringing a ton of zero pressure. They're bringing like everybody up at the line of scrimmage and he's checking to different stuff. He's checking different predictions. He's processing that. And then they drop out and he's got to make a decision about where to go with the ball. I like that stuff a little bit more and he seemed to handle that pretty well. So it's there. It's just the level of difficulty isn't always dialed up to 10. It's kind of in this, you know, five and a half, six range. Still give credit where credit's due, and I like him. And I think it's important to note this. His film is the best of everybody's, right? He's the Heisman play he's the Heisman winner for a reason. He's a really good football player. But the level of difficulty on some of that processing is 
is is hard is hard for me because there's not NFL level difficulty all the time, and it's kind of rare in his t- in his tape actually. So yeah, so one you can only take the test that's in front of you, and yes. so that's that's immediately you know what people are going to say is like, well, what was he supposed to do? And it's like and it, and so I, he I did agree. exactly yeah. what he's supposed to do, um, but that doesn't mean that he all of a sudden like that the other context of that you ignore and you just throw it out and be like, well. Uh, I guess we have to take him number two then. Like, no, you have to you have to try to project that forward uh, as much as possible. But in that projection, here would be my question: Is we know that like Lamar Jackson faces simpler defenses because they are scared like crazy that he is going to run, and that causes a simplified back end. It causes simplified rushes because if you get out of your lane or if you leave something available, he is going to take it in a way that no other quarterback in the league can so with Jaden is he going to see 10 difficulty levels at the NFL in the same way a stationary pocket passer will or is that actually translatable on some level because teams will have to account for his legs in a way that they don't anybody basically except for Lamar yeah so I do think you do get simpler coverage structures and I think if you look at the one game where you're seeing like really hard stuff from a coverage standpoint it's I think you could look at the Missouri game <clears throat> and you could look at the Alabama game, which are two of his best games in my opinion. Um, and the difficulty level is extremely high now. The con- now the pass concepts are still relatively low, but he's doing ha- he has to do a lot of kind of internal processing in that game, and I think he shows an ability to kind of take a step forward, right? Because I think to your point, like you're going to see sim- simpler coverage structures because what are going to see more consistent coverage structures because what he can do with his legs, right? I think that's that's important to acknowledge. But also, I think he's shown an ability to, in those in the Alabama game, in the Missouri game, to kind of be like, yes, no, it's too muddy, I don't like it, and then the playmaking ability takes over. And I think that's that type of stuff gets gives me a lot of confidence from a processing standpoint because you're like, here's a dude against maybe the best defense in college football, probably Michigan, but maybe second best defense in college football in Alabama, and he's making consistent decisions. The ball placement's correct. And again, the concepts are not dialed to 11 in terms of what they're asking him to do from the pocket, but he is making decisions and he's executing the offense at a high level. And before he gets hurt, like they're in the game, you know, and I think it's a, it's a purely a testament to him and what he does offensively. So yes, I think the, the, the simplification at the, at the, at the NFL level is totally going to be a thing, but also I think in, even in the context of some of those more challenging games, even against Missouri, like they've got a lot of good coverage players. They've got great defensive linemen. They, they bring different pressure packages. It's a complicated defense and he handles those pretty well. And so I think like that, that again is a testament to him. Again, the simplicity of the offense is, is very glaring, but I think he's still making good decisions again. And if you watch like Michael Penix versus Michigan, which is a Alabama kind of defense, they don't even look like they're in the same park in terms of how they're processing that stuff. So, yeah. Um, so let's, because this is a podcast and this is the kind of thing you do on a podcast, Let's let's strip that down even more, big, even like yeah. bigger picture away from Daniels. When you say a simplified offense, like what what do you mean by that? Simplified offensive concepts versus complex offensive concepts. What makes them simple or complex? So I think <clears throat> I think a good juxtaposition is like JJ McCarthy. So like when you get deep crossers over the middle of the field, you have to account for underneath defenders in a different way, right? So everyone says, oh, like Jane Daniels throws outside the numbers at a really high level. He does. He throws outside the numbers at a really high level. It's easier because there's less people in the picture, right? There's a corner out there. There's maybe a underneath hook player, flat player, and then there's a safety. So there's kind of a three person thing that you have to look at so if the hook player's in the way i'm going to throw the check down if he doesn't if he kind of sits with that underneath coverage i'm going to throw the comeback right and if the and if the formation is formationed in a way i can just throw the comeback and not even think twice about it because that hook player has to actually has to push to the three by one side or push to the back whatever it is so they've done a really good job of simplifying that and so there's not all these kind of deep crossing routes over the middle of the field he does throw digs, right? But even in the context of those digs, it's like <clears throat> it's like dig wheel. So basically, you're trying to pull the flat player out and then get that corner to carry off of the dig so that I can layer that in off the inside ear or the, the outside ear of the hook player, right? And so that's a relatively easy concept to throw because there's not a lot of moving parts. 
Whereas with like JJ, and again, like he has thrown stuff like that. So what game was that? That was again in the Missouri game. They're running like Y high cross and they're running the deep crosser and the guy's running a post on the outside. He reads it out and he throws the post. So I'm not to say that there's no throws like this on tape for him, sure. but they're just not at the same frequency at it. Like JJ McCarthy, like when you watch his all, his all cut up, it's like every throw is like that. It's like deep crosser. We got drive. Drive is kind of, in my opinion, a nightmare to read for a quarterback because we got a crosser coming from right to left. We got a dig coming from left to right. We got a back going, checking out to the right to kind of make this triangle. I have to be able to read the safeties. I have to read all the underneath hook players and I have to be able to make this throw on time. And so that's the level of difference is like, there's not like a lot of that NFL concept stuff. And again, that's not his fault. That's not his fault. That's the offense, but it does give you questions about his processing is great in these certain situations, but they don't run. It's like, they, I feel like they probably run and I talked to a couple of people in the NFL about this. They probably run five to 10 pass concepts and they're just really good at them. Like I was talking about um, Brian Thomas Jr. And they're like, oh yeah, he runs eight routes. And you're like, that's it. That's all he runs all season long, eight routes. And that's a really kind of Damn. low route volume, you know, for a receiver. Yeah. And I think that speaks to what the offense is there. So again, how do you extrapolate that out? And it's a data point because he's handling it really well. Jaden Daniels right. is handling it really, really well. But there's a level of simplicity here that we need to acknowledge. So the last part of that, this from a question standpoint, before we get to May and McCarthy and, and kind of their processing abilities is if I'm Cliff, can I go to Dan and Adam and be like, I can install an offense that's similar enough that I think we could get major production because you don't get bonus points for complexity, right? At the end of the day, there's a scoreboard in the NFL. It's not a bunch of judges sitting at the side, giving you a score based off your execution times a preset difficulty like they do in gymnastics or figure skating at the Olympics, right? It is, do you score or not? And so could you design an offense that is simple um, in the same way that LSU's was, but that is still just as productive uh, at the NFL level? Yeah, I think that's a that's a great question. I know a lot of coaches, like, you know, when I'm an offensive coordinator, that's all I think about is how do I make this as simple as possible? Like, that's all you think about. Because, like, if it's easier for the quarterback, the offense is more likely to go, right? Um, the problem is, like, you need to have a, enough good football players to make sure that that works. And so one thing I will say about Cliff when I watched him in Arizona is I was really impressed – with how he was able to manufacture opportunities. So if you can manufacture five explosive plays, like you're doing pretty good as an offensive coordinator. And I feel like Cliff, you know, depending on the game, is between like five and eight, which is pretty good. Like, you know, like pretty good opportunity. And then I also thought he did a pretty good job of giving a quarterback a nice, clean pre-snap. I think we've talked about the three-by-one stuff where it's like, if you like the matchup to the one, take it. If this concept is good, take like just giving him clean opportunities. And so I do think they're one of the elements of the air raid. And one of the elements of Cliff's offense is just in general is I do think he does a good job of kind of simplifying it for the quarterback. And one of the reasons he's had success with all these different college players, some NFL guys, is because I think he understands that principle at a high level, probably because he played the position. I haven't talked to him about it, but I would assume that's why. So I think like, yes, I think that's entirely possible. It's just like, can you live in that all the time? would be my question. And I do think it's important to note, like Jaden Daniels is a worker. So like, if you give him something, he's going to work and he's going to try and get better at it. The question is like, where is it? Cause like he's going from something that's very not complicated to something that is going to be probably 50%, 75%, 100% more complicated in terms of what they're asking him to do. And I think that, that that's where the does this great processing you see at LSU with this great offensive line, these great skill position players, and a, a kind of a simplified offense translate to the NFL level where the throwing windows are going to be tighter. And I heard this criticism of Drake May, like Drake May doesn't throw with great timing. And someone immediately responded to me and was like, well, he's not throwing to people he can trust to be open when they're supposed to be open, like Jaden Daniels. And so right. it is, it, I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth because he's he didn't do anything wrong. But I think the context around it does make it challenging for me to be like, Yes, he's going to be a great pro. Like, I like his film a lot. He's one of my favorite players in the draft. Just be clear about that. But that is a reservation I have about what I watch on film. Right. And it's a projection game. And that's yeah. why this is so bleeping hard. <laughs> Wrapping up here on Take Command with Logan Paulson. I am Craig Hoffman. So that's Jaden Daniels. Let's get to May and McCarthy. Let's start 
with Drake May because it's the antithesis in a lot of ways. Uh, you do not have the trust level. You do not have the, uh, you're, you're never plus in terms of the talent around you compared to what you're playing against. Because th this is another part of this evaluation that we can touch on here with Drake is even though Jaden Daniels played against better defenses, he always had the better talent. Like he was playing almost in an NFL offense against an SEC defense from a talent right. standpoint where Drake May was playing on a bad ACC offense against ACC defenses. So yes, SEC defenses greater than sign, uh, ACC defenses, but the relative talent that yeah. you're playing with versus against Jaden had it easier, which to me isn't even a shot at Jaden and people then to be like, Oh, well, how are you going to hold that against Jaden? To me, it's just an explainer for some of the difficulties that Drake may had. But he did have them. He did have those spots on his tape where the footwork is all over the place. And he didn't overcome some of those circumstances. So how do you try to make sense of, hey, it's there sometimes. Uh, and there's all these reasons that make sense that uh, it's not there, the others. But at the end of the day, the results are the results. Yeah, and, and he's and he's really tough to watch. Because again, like he's, he's like the ultimate tease, you know, like he... Yeah. He'll show you something that is only he can really do in the class, right? And like, like I've mentioned this a million times, and I and I encourage everyone to go do this. Watch his big time throws. It's there's a cut up of it online, um, and it's just like these are NFL throws. These are NFL windows. This is NFL timing. And I, I want to retract that timing element a little bit because it's not always timing. He's got this like playmaking moxie, like very Farvian in that kind of way, right? Where everyone says like you know Caleb Williams does this great job of being a creator at the position, and I think. Drake May does it the second best in the class. The problem is Caleb, when you watch him, he's so consistent with his feet. He's so consistent with his timing, like on the easy stuff. Like he hits, he gets on base and he shows you ability to consistently just get on base. And that's why he's going to be the first pick in the draft, right? Because he can yeah. create, he's got a tremendous arm, but he also can do the easy stuff with relative consistency. And then you look at Drake May and the high stuff is high. But and, and you've watched a ton of Drake May film, and you can attest to this. Like, it's maddening to me when you miss a five yard out and the guy's yes. wide open, and you and you turf it, and it's a bad miss. Like I understand you you throw it a little bit arm, and the guy accelerates and can't quite. Get, I get it. But when you throw the ball over the dude's head, when you turf the football, when we're missing throws, or we got a slant and we throw it high, guys to jump up and get it, and there's like running room, you know, in like cover two, like get through there and get going. Like that stuff is maddening to me when you watch it because. At the NFL level, like I think Kirk Cousins is a great example. Like Kirk does not miss layups. He takes layups. He takes what the defense is giving him and he makes you pay. If you cannot do that at a fundamental level, I have a lot of reservation. I, the, the high stuff is great. Like I love it because that, that ultimately, like that's those are money downs. That's third down. That's red zone. That's backed up. That's when you got to make a big play. That's what you need to see. But to function at the offensive level, you got to hit the basics. And I think that's the thing about him that I find really con like disconcerting is you see, like, I think, for example, you watch the Minnesota game, which is maybe unfair because that's probably his worst game. But like, he, he's, he's feeling pressure that's not there. The, remember the pat thing I was telling you about? He's patting the heck out of the football. He's scrambling when he doesn't need to. He's running into pressure. He's still making plays, but that, that polish that you get with Jaden, right? Where I got a good feel in the pocket, the ball's out on time. It's not there. Now, he's then you go to like Virginia and he's throwing the ball over the yard. He looks great. But there's sections where he doesn't quite get it done the way it needs to get done. Or you watch Miami and Miami's heating him up and he doesn't have a protection answer. Now, is that his fault? I have no idea. But all of those, th those things are big things to me in terms of yeah. just doing basics, getting on base consistently that I, I have a really hard time with him in terms of the evaluation. This is why I've come off of him a lot because I think I try to spend a lot of time thinking about like, what are we actually doing here? Right. Yeah. What is it that we actually want when we're, when we're doing the show during the season and we talk about good quarterback play, what does that look like? And it doesn't look like the stuff that he, like the stuff that we like, he doesn't do well, but this is the problem when you watch him is you go, he misses the, those throws that we're talking about, these layups. He turfs one. He throws the ball over a guy's head. Um, he gets picked because he, he leads a guy too much on a slant. The ball gets tipped and, and, and is picked off. And you're like, I can't draft this guy. And then he comes back and he makes the sickest throw you've ever seen. And you're like, yeah. I can't not draft this guy. Yeah. Um, and, and it's just a matter of what do you like. And I think the other part that's really hard with him 
And this is, I think you hear more from like the Nate Tices of the world and the, the folks who have access to the all 22 on a consistent basis with him is their offense is apparently terrible. Yeah, like whatever they were running at North Carolina just did not give him answers on a consistent basis. And so schematically he's playing in a deficient way where LSU gave Jaden or gave Jaden Daniels uh, answers uh, a lot. I will say this about Jaden Daniels too, though. Like, there's times where he doesn't have answers, but dude makes plays. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So he like elevates the offense, and I think, and to be fair to Drake May, he does elevate the offense also. But there is, I think, that's a great point. There, you need you need to make sure the quarterback has an answer, and he doesn't always have right. that at North Carolina. So right, and so there's times where like Nate talks about how the one of the things he looks for in a quarterback is like, are you doing side to side, like sideline to sideline read? Are you oh, just, yeah. do you have no idea where to go with the football? And so you start left and then you come all the way back, right. And you're doing left and you're just like, is somebody open somewhere? And that's like right. a telltale sign because no offense is designed that way. If the quarterback's eyes are doing that, that is a bad sign for processing, except for in North Carolina's offense. They ask him to do that sometimes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so you're just like, Oh, that's, that's not very helpful. That's not very quarterback friendly. And so when we talk about the footwork and some of that stuff and, and it coming back to trust and confidence, uh, you understand why Drake May doesn't have it. And that makes it really hard to evaluate because then you have to go like, okay, well, if we were able to set him up in a more confident space, could we get the most out of his talent? And if so, we should probably draft him because he'll be awesome. Yeah. And if not, then we're going to have a disaster on our hands and he's going to probably not just not be a top 10 guy, but he could bust and, we, and we're back in quarterback hell or back in quarterback purgatory in three, four years. And we haven't done much winning in the meantime. I think where I come down, um, which is going to shock people because, again, people think I can't, like, I'm a Drake May guy, for instance, is, like, I kind of come off him because of that where I just, I would rather someone that I can trust to make layups, and if I had to rank them today, he's the guy I feel least comfortable drafting while also knowing that is the biggest risk because he might wind up being the best of the bunch. Yeah, I think that's a tough thing. It's like you go back to that scout thing we talked about in the first segment. It's like, you know, if you can do it once, you can do it. And like, he can freaking do it, man. And I think that's <laughs> the thing about like when you watch like, you know, that that binary yes, no for the NFL. Like Jaden Daniels, I have I have real questions about can you make consistent NFL throws? Like that's a question I have. And again, he's got a good arm. He's got a quick release. His fundamentals are great. But Drake May, I don't have that same question because of his ability to kind of like laser stuff in there find the, the the position for the football like small windows tight windows and again this is encompassing all the baggage we just talked about with him the long kind of languid release like the more space in the pocket required to throw the football that's all there but the nfl throws that he does make are incredible and you're kind of like he can do that and he's going to be asked to do that at the next level and so that's a yes for him and it's a maybe for Jaden. And that's where this gets so confusing. Because everything else with Jaden is better. But they didn't ask him to do anything overly complicated in college, right? In terms of these types of throws we're discussing. So I think that's where I have a really hard time with this. Because there's a lot of stuff that makes you go, nope, don't want that. Nope, 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 nope. But then you say, all the, the maybe the most important thing is like these NFL-style windows, these NFL-style throws. And Drake's got him and he does him well. And so you say, well, that, that's why to me, he's a perfect candidate to say, hey, you got to sit for a year because like we're going to get these mechanics cleaned up. We're going to get you playing correctly. We're going to do the Aaron Rodgers treatment and you're going to become out like gangbusters, you know, like the million dollar man and be awesome. And I think you got to look at the teams. So like and again, the question to, to fans I have is like, do you think Washington could do that? I know Peter said yes. I don't know if I agree with Mariota kind of in that role, but um, but yeah, that, that's kind of my thought on Drake May. Yeah. And honestly, my response to that very quickly is I don't care about 2024's record. I care about the, where you are in three years. And if, and if you have to play Marcus Mariota this year, like, am I psyched about it? Is that going to make our show fun? Is that going to make watching them as fun? <laughs> right. Like, obviously not selfishly. I hope the rookie plays because it's more to talk about, but if I'm the team, if I'm the GM specifically, I want what is best for my team in the next three to five years. And if that means the the guy, the kid sits and Marcus Mariota is playing a lot of football this year, then so freaking be it. But yeah. that also brings us to the, the split the baby, if you will. And that is JJ McCarthy. 
um, because McCarthy has a lot of the NFL stuff on tape. That's almost all he has on tape uh, because of the low throw volume and, the, and what Michigan asked him to do because they were constantly more so often asking him to turn around and hand the ball to Blake Corum. Um, and also they were up in a bunch of games and, and all of those things, but he does have a lot of physical traits. And I think that is the thing that is undersold with McCarthy is when you want the physical talent, like we kind of said, he's got B plus everything. He might have a minus on some of this stuff. Like there are, I don't know about elite traits, but like really, really high level traits when it comes to his speed, when it comes to his arm strength. And so I think then it comes down to that processing element And what are we actually getting in J.J. McCarthy as a prospect here? What is his ceiling? And and also from that mental processing standpoint, could that be the thing that separates him and actually does give him the potential to be one of the top guys in the NFL and thus worthy uh, of a number two pick without much second guessing? Yeah, and this was, you know, when you watch his throws, I mean, this is just maybe very telling. So, you know, like when you watch the cut up of throws and runs for Jaden Daniels, it's an hour and 45 minutes. When you watch the one for Drake May, it's an hour and I think 47 minutes, right? When you watch the one for J.J. McCarthy, it's 45 minutes. <laughs> it's, sign- it's it's under half, right? It's it's incredibly short compared to what those guys did because of what they asked them to do in Michigan. And the thing, uh, the thing about it is, I, it's so hard for me to watch him because I love him so much. Like I love because, and it's and it's a and it's probably because of the NFL offensive background. But there's NFL throws, the way he's manipulating coverage players, like with his eyes, like you know they run like a co concept, so out in the corner. I think I've mentioned this before, but I love it. I love seeing this from the quarterback. He looks to the flat. The guy matches the flat. He throws the corner like that ability to understand what the defense is doing what I can do to manipulate them, like that's good. That's excellent stuff, right? Like the throw that he made against Alabama where it's like they're running drive and the guy's crossing the field, the tight end's running a dig, and he throws it right, like literally right at the middle linebacker's face and the middle linebacker matches the drive route because he should. You know as the quarterback that's supposed to happen. Whizzes right by his ear. The guys even see it. Tight end catches it in a perfect window. Like that is NFL big time throw stuff and so for me like i love that and it's probably because like it looks most like the nfl like when you watch him at the line of scrimmage he's checking the different runs like harbaugh's notorious like i was talking to colt mccoy about this when we were playing so this is like 2013 probably and he was saying oh they have we have we have something called perfect like that's the play call it's perfect and what it is is it's four runs and the quarterback has to get you in the right run based on front and coverage and so, like, you got to be a smart son of a gun to execute that offense. And you can see there's times where he's at the line of scrimmage getting people locked in. And so, you know, his tests, you talk about giving the test that was given you, his test definitely was probably the most conducive to NFL football. It's like the most translatable. And then when you watch him run, like, I think he's a better athlete than Drake May. I think he's more dynamic. I think he's got a natural playmaking ability. I forget what game it was. Sorry, I probably should have made a note of it. But, like, He's skating the pocket. He's remaining a thrower. He pushes the football down the field and just does all this stuff. And you're like, and again, he has bad games. I forget. It was like Indiana where he throws all those picks. Like he has bad games, no doubt about it. But like, he just seems to have that kind of NFL panache already. And again, this is a projection game, you know, so Jaden Daniels is a better athlete, probably a quicker release. Drake Mays probably got a bigger arm, um, maybe more natural playmaking ability. But in terms of running that offense at Michigan, like, it was pretty slick by him, you know? And like, yeah. again, like the, the leverage throws they got to make, it's, it's tough. It's tough. So. Yeah. Um, and, and my, my pushback to play devil's advocate here yeah, play, um, would please. be like, are we just lacking imagination? Because, oh, well, here it is. It's <laughs> NFL It's NFL caliber. Well, we yeah. should just take that guy. And it's like, that's not how this works all the time. Just because he did it in college. And it's the same thing as Jaden. It's the same thing as Drake to an extent where we're asking this, be, if they haven't done it yet, can they do it? Yeah. With, with JJ, he's done it. Now, can he do it at an even higher level? And to what level? Because you know there is a volume control with him, right? Like I talk about this all the time with with the NBA, right? Especially this year's Wizards. Like Denny Avia. Uh, now I'm going to go complete Wizards here, but Denny Avia is a very good basketball player, and right now he is the Wizards' probably best or second best player. And there is a reason why they're not winning any games. That's not to say Denny Obvia is bad. It's to say that if Denny Obvia is your best player, you are going to have 
trouble winning NBA basketball games. And so, yes, he can average 30 or he can score 30 points on a given night, but you are much better off with him taking the number of shots and having the ball in his hands at a level where he's scoring 18-ish points and there is someone better than him who is trying to score 25, 30 points a night. You're going to win more games that way. And so with JJ, you're going to now ask him, instead of having to make six throws a game, he might have to make 10 or 12. And what does that mean in terms of your chances to win? So when you up that volume, can you maintain the efficiency and that is the big question for him. And then you you juxtapose that question and that answer with, okay, Drake and Jaden haven't done the things that we've seen JJ do by NFL standards, but can they? And yeah. that's those answers. If you can answer those questions correctly, congratulations, you win the game. Yeah. Uh, you know who they should take at number two. Um, and by the way, those are all dynamic questions and answers, depending on your offense, your development staff, your environment, who they're playing with, yada, yada, yada. It's a great point. And again, like I went back and watched uh, Justin Herbert from a couple of years ago. I went back and watched uh, Josh Allen just to see like what kind of prospects they were. Cause you know, they were, and you know, like Herbert, you know, like I think there's, you know, you see the arm town, but he's kind of robot. And so like, even with him, who's a guy that I like a lot as an NFL player, like I didn't really see, like, I didn't really see what he became at the NFL level. Like it was there, like, you know, like now in hindsight, you're like, Oh, like th this is why, why you right. love it. And same thing with Josh, like Josh Allen was a crazy man playing football. Like, Holy yes. cow. You're like, this is like untenable. And then he became one of the best quarterbacks. He had so, like a sub 60% completion percentage. In college. Yeah, it, was nuts. it was wild. And he's just ripping this thing. His fundamentals are terrible. He's trucking linebackers. He's like, this is fun to watch, but this is insane. But I think the point there is, is like the bills believed in, in Herbert. Right, they're not in in, uh, in, in Allen. Allen yeah. Right, they let him. They let him kind of go through all of his growing pains for like two and a half years, and when a lot of teams would have moved on, they saw something in him. He turned a corner and started playing good football. And I think like that's ultimately what you're talking about here is like, can this team, the Commanders, support one of these players enough, specifically Drake May, Jaden Daniels, so that they can make these plays when they need to make them, and and it might be a year and a half from now. It might be two years from now. But if you think one of these dudes can get there, like you got to take the shot on him. I think the thing that's so enticing about JJ is it's there. You're like, he's done it. I've seen him do it. He's got a good arm. He's got a playmaking ability. Like, take it. But to your point, like what happens when he's like got to be the guy? Now, you know, I, I, Dan Quinn's a smart guy. He said this a bunch of times. Like, we're going to play good defense. We're going to run the football that's going to insulate a young quarterback regardless. And so, I don't know, maybe you want those guys that the throws are so good. Like the good throws for him are so NFL-y. It's like you could you could like it, like juxtapose them. Like they're so like that. The problem is that there's not he's only doing it like like less than half the time those other guys are. And so again, the question becomes, do you think Jane Daniels can add a little bit of complexity? Do you think Drake May can clean up his footwork and clean up his fundamentals? And do you think J, uh, JJ can handle a larger larger share of the offense? And like you said, if you have the answer to that, you should be making more money than you're making right now because every NFL team would want to talk to you about it. Right. Uh, and then, of course, there's all the stuff that we don't know, the interviews, et cetera, oh, et cetera. Yeah. Um, which, as we talked about at the top, matters a lot. All right. Uh, if you're sick of us talking about quarterbacks, uh, good news. There's only two and a half more weeks of it uh, because the NFL draft is coming up on April 25th. I will be there for the first round in Detroit, which is really exciting. Uh, have the Hoffman Show live from Detroit on the 25th. Of course, we have plenty more coverage here on Take Command between now and then, including our chat Wednesday with Mina Kimes, which you'll hear Thursday morning. Our chat Friday with Dane Brugler, which you'll hear Monday morning. And we got a couple of other awesome things on the agenda between now and the 25th. A couple more mock drafts as well. Uh, so we are excited to do all of that. For Logan Paulson, who you can follow on Instagram at Logan underscore Paulson 82 and check out uh, on the Commander's YouTube page as well for all the stuff he's doing over there. I am Craig Hoffman. You can listen to on the radio four to seven daily on the Team 980 and we'll see you next time on Take Command. Thanks for watching this clip of Take Command, which has a brand new home. That's right. You can watch on YouTube at the Team 980. You can also listen to full episodes in the free Odyssey app, which is now enabled with Apple CarPlay. So we'll just, you know, follow you around. <laughs>